told, they'll want us to pay for it to get fixed. Please enjoy, join me in a salute to the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Welcome to the Board of Selectmen's meeting for March 5th, 2018. Uh, we're going to start with a public hearing at 7 o'clock, public hearing pursuant to RSA 41-14-A, Proceedings 8A Atlantic Avenue, Map 269, Lot 38A, for the release of deed restriction number 4, specifically the re release of will not erect any buildings upon the premise within seven feet of any boundary line, first hearing. Anybody from the public wishing to be heard on this? Seeing none, the board. Rusty? I got nothing right now. Bill? Negative, sir. Okay, so we'll close the public hearing at 7.01, and we'll go to public comment period. Anybody from the public wishing to comment? Yes, sir. Good evening to the Board of Selectmen, our manager. Article 9 of this year's warrant article asks $1.5 million for the purpose of reconstruction a portion of Lafayette Road to Toll Avenue to include street repairs and reconstruction materials and labor and also to include associated drainage systems maintenance and re replacement replacement of sidewalks, the installation of ornamental street lining, granite curbing, and other roadway infrastructure needs. To sugarcoat this article, taxpayers are not being asked for money. The town plans to take it from the Road Improvement Capital Fund, which will essentially drain that fund because we only got 1.6 million in it, and you're here to take a look at what you're asking for, <coughs> five. On the surface and upon first read, one does not necessarily gasp. We're tied up with the sewer issue. But then recollection sets in. I refer you to Articles 11 and 44 of last year's warrant articles. Article 11 calls for $1.1 million to replace the sewer main on Lafayette Road, High Street to Winnicott Road, <clears throat> and to perform the associated reconstruction and patching of the roadway. There was no mention of drainage issues at that time. The sewer work was done, and the plan at that time in the fall was to pave it in the spring. It was mentioned several times by the DPW director as well as the town manager. We can pave this. We got the current money. No mention of drainage. Please note, for the purpose of this warrant article, the total financial impact is not 1.1, but 1.8, because you got interest, a 0.8 over 30 years. Now on Article 44. By the way, there's 613,000 left in that fund for the road, paving of the road. Now on to Article 44 of the 2017 warrant. Article 44 was for 300,000, which by the way, 297,500 remain unspent and lapses this month for the reconstruction of Lafayette Road from High Street to Winnicott Road again. This would include street, sidewalk, utility, and lighting. Sound familiar? For the Hampton Village to revitalize the downtown. The preliminary design would be used to support a future project that might be funded by grants and has the potential to be funded by the Road Improvement Capital Reserve Fund as well. Sound familiar again? And this was backed up with a 30,000 deposit by, uh, or a donation by Experience Hampton. There's 297 left in that fund. We don't even think, we don't even know what's happening with that fund. There's been no status, there's no, there's no accounting for it, nobody is speaking for it. I don't know anything that's happening there. And it lapses this month. Be advised that between these two funds, last year's $1.1 million request article, uh, whatever it was now, I forgot, 11. And the 44 is 910712 unspent dollars, almost a billion bucks sitting there doing nothing. <clears throat> and then now $1.5 million for another project is being offered up. <clears throat> Enough already. So there you have it. Sounds like the town is trying to accomplish in Article 9 in this year's warrant a good part of what Experience Hampton was trying to accomplish with Article 44 last year. And I won't go through what, what the intentions were of Experience Hampton with their, grant, with their grants and their visions and their plans, but I don't know anything about it right now. In summary, 
We have 613,000 left in last year's warrant Article 11. There is 297,500 left in the Article 44 that is lapsing at the end of this month. <clears throat> this is a grand total of 910,000 unspent dollars sitting in the capital warrant status listings and affecting taxpayers. The town is now asking to, uh, for a 2018 warrant Article 9 for one and a half million more for the same roadway. That poor roadway is getting a lot of attention and to perform associated maintenance and replacement of the drainage system, which we really haven't heard much about for a year and a half at least. In addition, the town looks to be trying to accomplish the plan of Experience Hampton. Just look at the similarities of what the town is asking for the money to do with Article 9 and what Experience Hampton looked for in Article 44 last year. Very similar. The capital fund is being drained as well, just as the 2007, 17 Article 44 prophesied. By using the capital road fund, the taxpayers are not being asked to provide money. It's a sugar-coated, it's a sugar-coated warrant. Good strategy to use when you want to pass something. All this is too much for me. My suspicions are raised on all fronts. I recommend a very loud no on this Article 9. Very loud no. We can use such money that is in the capital reserve fund, 1.6 million, on streets and towns that truly need to be addressed and where a solid rationale can be presented. Such is not the case with this Article 9. Article 9 poses too many questions for me. I've been on, I've been on presidential circle for 39 years. Has never been paved. Okay, There's too go, many cracks. we got to go with the three minutes, Too many please. cracks. Thank you. The count. <laughs> I got it, Jim. This is the, uh, for you. Good evening. Article 9. Mary Louise. I'm sorry? Identify yourself, please. Everybody oh, knows I know about. Oh, sorry about that. I, I thought I'd been keeping low here. I'm uh, Mary Louise Woolsey, 148 Little River Road. Article 9 on the warrant. I have a concern as well on the road capital reserve fund. Looking at the trustees of the trust funds report on page 69 of the uh, town report for 2017, the Road Improvement Capital Reserve Fund received a deposit of $300,000 from the 2017 Warrant Article 21. There were no disbursements during 2017. The ending principal and income balance was $1,593,158. If Article 9 is approved, we're going to end up stripping that fund. The purpose of that fund was to acquire, over a period of time, a large credit balance to do some of the major road projects. I sat with you gentlemen, all of you, about two to three years ago, when we were talking about the Exeter Road and the cost to do the Exeter Road. We've, we've slapped some hot top on, on top of the east end of the Exeter Road now, but the estimate at that time to do the Exeter Road properly, dig up the sewer lines, which are old, the drainage lines, would cost in the neighborhood of $5 million. Suppose in the next five years or so, we have to tackle that project. You're stripping this fund. You have Article uh, 21 here to add another 300,000. Wow, that's really going to get you a good construction job. I am puzzled that the Board of Selectmen has sponsored this article on the warrant. Um, I feel it's in response to a small special interest group called Experience Hampton. And political pressure has apparently been put on, you folks. Um, I seem to recall, Mr. Waddell, your wife works with Experience Hampton, I think. Um, I think that uh, the other problem with this article, as I'm reading it, it says to fund such appropriation through the withdrawal of $1,500,000 from the Road Improvement Capital Reserve Fund this will be, oh, and no amount to be raised from taxation. 
if you look at the end of the article as it's printed for the warrant, it says fiscal impact note finance department, no tax impact. That's not true. Tax impact has already occurred. I'm sorry, I know I don't want to get your watch upset. Three minutes. But the tax impact has already occurred. You take $1.5 million out now, it took us five years with $300,000 deposits per year just to get to the $1 million five. I hope the voters turn this down. There are far more important road projects that need to be done. Thank you, Thank you gentlemen and Regina. Anybody else in the public wishing to be heard? I'm Mike Pierce, 84 Lock Road. <clears throat> Have been here for a while. Last week, Selectman Bean requested that Article 9 be put on tonight's agenda to discuss the concern I raised last week, public comment. But it's not on the agenda. Taxpayers need to know more about this pr proposed expenditure, including this year's art proposed Article 9, which cleans out the road at Capital Reserve Fund. Over $3 million has been allocated to the downtown business district since 2015, mostly Lafayette Road. Article 15 in 2015, 449000 for the downtown drainage system. 2017, Article 11, 1.1 for sewer pipes and road reconstruction. 2017, Article 4, 44, 300,000 experience Hampton downtown revitalization. 2018, Article 9, 1.5 million for downtown drainage, sidewalks, and curbing and ornamental lighting. This is only about a half a mile stretch of road. And if the town maintains 70, the town does maintain about 75 miles of road in Hampton, if we spend at this rate on all roads, it comes to half a billion dollars. You have only proposed $316,000 this year to address all the other roads in town. What makes this area such a high priority over all others? I don't remember any public discussion other than the 46 seconds the selectmen took to approve Article 9 on November 20, 2017. I watched your discussion after public comment last week, and I feel it's in this disingenuous to say that this has no re relationship to the experience Hampton re revitalization project. John Tenius highlighted sewer drainage sidewalks and lighting when describing his vision of improvements needed downtown speaking on behalf of experience Hampton at last year's delivery session. The language in issues article 9 includes drainage, sidewalks, granite curbing and ornamental lighting. What happened to the grants from John Nyan and Lib Diane Libby of Experience Hampton were going to pay for this beautification effort. That's what they said at last year's deliberation, deliberation session. The 2015 Warren article for drainage improvements on High Street and Lafayette Road supposedly took care of the drainage issues on at least part of Lafayette Road in the same location as Article 9. Mike, you got to wrap it up, please. Okay, I'm almost finished. Why was 1% of last year's 300000 spent for, uh, for, for operating, uh, creating, for, for creating a plan? The 300000 lapses this month. Also, there's 313000 left from the 2017 Ward Article 11 to finish the paving on Lafayette Road. In closing, I recommend the taxpayers of Hampton to vote no on Article 9. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Yes. Timothy Citizen Jones, 16 Dustin Avenue. I didn't come here prepared to speak, but some of these points that were raised I think are important to emphasize. Lafayette Road needs to be paved. There's no doubt about that. Last year, $1.1 million were put aside to do the uh, sewer and repaving of Lafayette Road. At the Budget Committee, I asked the DPW Director where the design plans were for that work. He informed me there was no need for design plans because they were simply replacing what is existing. 
made perfect sense to me. I supported it. I asked him when it's going to be done. He said, absolutely, October. No later than October. October comes around, and what happens? Magically, the contractor runs into ledge. Now, I am still trying to get in my brain how you can run into ledge going down existing pipe. Ledge does not grow like trees. So the project was put on a delay. And so the public has now been suffering through all of this winter from October to date with a very rough road that obviously needs paving. When these issues were brought up last week, when the selectmen did address the topic and Mr. Bean asked for it to be on tonight's agenda, more than one of the selectmen said, I thought it was for paving. Well, no, the 1.1 was for the paving. You voted to suspend that contract because the contract, contractor ran into this thing called ledge, which magically appeared. Now, to me, it seems awful suspicious that we were delaying the paving so that everyone would have the perception we needed more money to pave it. There is money that the town manager has told the budget committee just a couple months ago, still hasn't been spent, that's ready and available to fully pave the road. Article 9 has got nothing to do with paving the road. So I encourage everyone to vote no on 9. This looks to me like another magician job or a certain member of this community that I won't mention tonight, but perhaps on another night. Thank you very much. Thank you. Anybody else from the public wishing to be heard? Seeing none, we'll go to announcements and community calendar. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, I just want to thank all our departments for what they did this weekend, keeping everyone safe and the police, the fire, and also public works. They were still out there working pretty hard today, and I know they did all weekend, so thank you. Mr. B, uh, Mr. Russell, Mr. Bridal. Yeah, I'd like to say the same thing. You know, we, uh, we had a, a terrible storm, uh, but it's nothing like we haven't seen before in this town. And as usual, our workers, both police, fire, public works, uh, came out. You know, uh, we had a lot of wind. We had a number of houses that were hit with downed trees. We had a number of power outages for extended period of times in part of town. But we made it through it. And uh, I, wanna, I just want to thank everybody that was out there. Uh, I I'm a little concerned with all the, as somebody wrote the yahoos that were riding around the beach all summer and, 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 and getting in our police and fire department's way and the, uh, the state public works. Uh, you know, when we have a storm like that, I know it's pretty nice to go down and look at the beach. But please, stay off there. Let the police fire do their job. It's not good for your car. Um, and because uh, we have another one coming in, in two days. So uh, just be careful and be safe. Thank you. Mr. Griffin. Yes, I'd also like to uh, thank the police, the fire, the DPW, all the people that did a, a good job, and I'm sure they're going to be busy this week again. But <clears throat> I totally agree with what Rusty said. Um, I uh, was right at on Ocean Boulevard for every one of those high tides, and it was really unbelievable how many people were driving around. On a Friday night, I estimate it was more than 1,000 mm -hmm. cars an hour rode by my place. I kept counting the um, the every so many like every ten minutes I would count and there was twenty to the, most of the time closer to thirty people cars a minute going by. Some of them were the police and some of them were people that were doing the you know good work. But it was just it was terrible how many people were out there and uh, some at times the police had them stop so that they were uh, had to just make a circle at Little Jack's and go back again. But to ride through that water, it was, I think it does nothing but cause problems. And uh, definitely co would have caused problems for me, except that I had sandbags all set up and ready to go, and it was very successful. I didn't get any water. Um, but to me, to have that many people, on I don't know if it was because it was Friday night, but Saturday night there were very few people the same time uh, you know, period. But between 11 o'clock and 1.30 on Friday night, it was unbelievable how many people were out. So I hope that we'll be able to dis discuss that here tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Bean. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the Chief's here. He hasn't gotten any sleep in about uh, 
129,000 hours, so I want to make this quick. Uh, sometimes when you you do your job so well and there are no casualties and there are, there are no incidents and there are no, are no injuries and there are no deaths, people minimize the, uh, the professionalism that's executed by this municipal platform uh, directed by Mr. Welch. So kudos uh, to every single one of those uh, fine young men and women that work for the town of Hampton and for those that did stay out of the way. The rubbernecking is a big problem and those that underestimate the force of mother nature are often uh, uh, at the peril of losing their lives. As Mr. Bridal knows, uh, is a, a skipper with the fire department, is our chief knows. So again, uh, sometimes when you're so successful uh, that nothing happens, that people minimize the threat and the danger, and it was very, very, very dangerous. We will talk about uh, um, article number nine that was requested. I uh, applaud those that have come in here and uh, uh, questioned the expenditure of taxpayer funds. And again, out of respect to those that are here, including taxpayers and other department heads, um, I'll have some comments on uh, um, Mr. Rice's uh, manifesto that was in the Hampton Union, uh, that misogynist piece uh, uh, later on after our taxpayers and department heads have spoken. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, ditto on the uh, public safety people and the DPW. Consent agenda. Notice of welfare lien, 50 Hemlock ha oh, Haven Map 138, Lot 1-50. Parade and public gathering license, safe Seacoast Alliance for Emancipation, 5K <coughs> Run Walk, April 15, 18. Rockingham Planning Commission alternate representative appointment and Carnaby. 2017 tax deferral. Marquis, George and Nancy, uh, 2018 new elderly exemption, 2018 veteran credit, 2018 new veteran credit. I'll make the motion to approve. Second. All in favor? Unanimous. Appointments. We'll start with the chief since he hasn't had any sleep. I'll try not to babble on you. I do want to make one issue very clear that the term Yahoo was not me. I get credited with those things once in a while, but it was not me. <laughs> so we have experienced uh, an incredible four days uh, beginning Friday morning. Um, actually, before the planning stages, we knew this was going to be a significant event. Uh, we began holding meetings with the department he relative department heads. We we're going to have to uh, deal with the circumstances, and they were being predicted to be uh, fairly major in this area. Uh, we also were able to coordinate some efforts with our state partners at uh, New Hampshire Homeland Security and Emergency, Emergency Management, uh, DOT, and the state parks to be prepared so we would coordinate our efforts uh, to the best interest of safety of the folks living down there at the beach and those that would wander down there. Despite all the warnings that we give not to come down during these operations, we know there is that select few that do not heed those warnings and exercise incredibly poor judgment. Uh, to include bringing small children up along the seawall as waves are crashing over and rocks are coming over the side. It's um, just not sure why these weather events. I, I, I understand the, the curiosity. It is an incredible thing to behold, but you can do it from a safe distance, and people are walking right up on the wall when, with small kids. It was just it's difficult to watch people take those type of risks. So, again, we would uh, right to reinforce. We do have another storm coming. We actually have a uh, flood watch tonight. Uh, into tomorrow. Uh, these tides are going to continue, I believe, right through uh, to the next storm cycle. So we went around today looking, doing assessments, and as we were talking, some of the waves were starting to get high and splash over and right onto the, the group of people we were down with there making the assessment with the press. Uh, so it has been an impressive example of what Mother Nature can do, and we have to recognize that force and that power and that we have to take the proper precautions. As part of that coordinated effort, uh, we were able to secure some vehicles uh, that were of a better design to deal with those type of environmental conditions, uh, decommissioned military vehicles. And I want to thank the towns of Newton, New Hampshire, and Kingston, New Hampshire, for stepping forward and allowing us to use their equipment. It was. Uh, really saved, particularly on the fire department uh, apparatus. We weren't driving those large engines that cost a lot of, a lot of money and can be adversely affected by the salt water to allow us to use those vehicles that are designed to work in those harsh environments. We continue with our plans to try to procure some of those vehicles for the town of Hampton so we have those in stock in the future so we're able to handle those on our own. Um, again, obviously, when these things get this big, if we have to draw upon our, our partners, we will. The event on Friday <coughs> was 
probably the largest volume of water I've ever experienced coming over the seawall uh, in my time in this community since 1979. Uh, but it had a, a different effect because of the wind direction and the surge and the things that we were experiencing that normally High Street is an area that we just, we know is going to flood over. High Street stayed fairly dry uh, because of that northeast wind. It actually pushed the water over towards Winnicunit Road and we also experienced extensive flooding along the Route 1 corridor right there at the Hampton Falls line. Uh, one of the cars that got uh, stuck in the water was actually in that area where uh, fire and police went in to recover a woman and her young child that were stuck in the vehicle. Um, and we subsequently got the road shut down in, in uh, coordination with Hampton Falls. A lot of these roads stayed closed for upwards of three hours. Again, the reason being usually the water recedes quickly after that high tide mark. Uh, but with the conditions we had with the surge and the wind, it was trapping water in places and keeping it there that we hadn't experienced in the past to that degree. You turn around the next couple of tides, the wind direction had changed. So the type of water and where you were seeing the water changed. So that, that called on a lot of coordination and adaptability, particularly by police, fire, and public works to try to deal with those issues and trying to get the cooperation from the public, uh, which, which was a daunting task. Um, moving forward to Sunday, uh, I couldn't believe when I got up Sunday to come come in, uh, we had a road race coming in town that I thought we were going to have to cancel it. The incredible work that had been done by Public Works and uh, New Hampshire DOT to clear the roadways um, allowed that event to take place safely with no injuries, no issues. But shortly at the conclusion of the race, or just as it was concluding, the water started to break over the wall again and we did have to shut down Route 1A again in certain sections. Timing was everything. Uh, a few of the, the, the slower folks, I hate to call them that, but they got the, uh, the salt water shower, but they were uh, actually, as they went by my position, laughing and were enjoying the fact that there was a unique experience. Uh, but as the afternoon progressed, the uh, heavier stuff started coming and the rock came over again. So we again had to clear the roadways. Um, I believe DOT had to perform that mission on 1A at least five times over this weekend and into today we had some more uh, stuff debris coming over the wall uh, earlier this morning I expect it again this evening so moving forward uh, we do expect a significant weather event coming up uh, Wednesday and Thursday uh, with the storm and this is from the uh, National Weather Service we, we get this through our partners in Homeland Security we are looking at a potential of 8 to 12 inches of snow uh, in the Hampton area, they're, they're describing it as that heavy, wet snow. So that's going to be a little bit more work for us to push and get it out of the way. Uh, and again, with those high tides, uh, part of that storm is still uh, the residual surge that we get from those storms can last up to a week. And I believe we're going to experience some of that uh, probably right into Thursday and Friday. So again, the conditions are calmer right now. But again, I would, I would caution members of the public that want to come down and see this, that at the peak of the storms when we're trying to clear roads and, and, and try to get the folks that are really in need of us, tying up police and fire because you drove your car into a large puddle right. is, to, is aggravating, I have to be honest with you, because we, we just try and try to get that message out. Uh, we may have to resort to shutting down roads further out. Uh, we did that on Sunday. We wound up shutting down uh, Route 101 at Glade Path and turning all the cars around until we could get the area cleared out and let the water recede. We're going to have to resort to more of those type of uh, areas where we stop the traffic from getting down in and limit it to people that can, a bona fide residents trying to get in and check on their property. So, and if there's any questions from the board, I'd be happy to entertain them. When is yeah. the, oh, sorry. When is this weather supposed to start? Wednesday? Wednesday around 1 o'clock is what they're predicting, but that, that could change where we're still in a little distance out. That forecast will tighten up probably by tomorrow afternoon. I'll put more information out to the board as we get closer. Okay, so as far people will probably be smart if they're down there and they want to move their cars to do it on Wednesday. I would, I would highly recommend, I know we're going to have this discussion tomorrow at staff meeting, but uh, make arrangements so that the folks that are in those low-lying areas, again, can move their cars up into the municipal lots that are high and dry. Okay, thank you. Rusty? Yeah, uh, Fred, I had somebody call me the other day and ask, you know, they're all, we we're asking all these people to move their cars up off the beach. Is there any way that we could use the town bus to make a couple of scheduled trips so that if people want to get back to the beach? Depends on the time. 
Okay. Obviously, have to have a driver. Um, we can work on that tomorrow with staff meeting. It, it, it was a good idea when the lady called me. I thought yeah. it was a great idea to to have you know if, if we could schedule like uh, four or five o'clock in the afternoon after people get out of work if they want to park. We're going to make one trip down there, so anybody that wants to park their yeah. car up. You know, if we can get the word out, I think it's a great, it was a great Well, idea. let me coordinate with the rec director, and we'll see as long as the board's okay with that. We'll see if we can try to make that happen. I just think it helps our citizens out a little bit. So it was, it was a good good uh, recommendation. Other than that, Chief, you did a fine job, and we appreciate all you've done. Thank you. Rick. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, you know, was able to watch exactly, you know, you, I, it was very, I had to, I couldn't just go outside because I did have those sandbags. But your front yard was underwater. I checked several times. Yeah, but I didn't get any water. It was so good. And I saw people, I saw you going by numerous times. But, and I noticed that there were times where they put the sign high water and tried to keep people from going through and then must have had to get, go somewhere else and the people would just start coming through again. I just was uh, curious of why wouldn't they stop the traffic like at the beginning of Boar's Head so that people could turn there and go back? We alter it depending on where the flooding is and what we have for staffing. Now on Saturday uh, we had uh, staffed up very well and we also got some support from the New Hampshire State Police over the weekend. So we had five troopers helping us manage um, some of those areas where it's a, so it, was, it really comes down to staffing and where the flooding is coming in. I could see how it was different yeah. every time. Every it, tide changed. And you know like set, for me, it was amazing that there weren't very many people out Saturday night after watching the unbelievable amount of people that were out Friday night. Um, but, you know, that is pretty low there. And because uh, the reason why there were so many cars going around is because I, th I think it was the same cars going around and around and around. Yeah, I think you're right. They, <laughs> they went by, turned around at Little Jack's, went for another spin and came back again. I don't know if they were kids. There were a lot of them were in trucks, big trucks. And uh, I thought it was impressive also with the uh, trucks that you must be referring to that came from the other communities. It almost looked like they were service trucks. Yep, they're, they're uh, decommissioned military vehicles. There's yeah. a program where law enforcement can access those, uh, and we are actively pursuing a number of those vehicles for the town of Hampton. I hope that that's something that we do. I would certainly be supportive of that. So I would just ask that when it's going to be that type of a high tide, that maybe they would just block that area off for a couple hours. Uh, I also saw that you know, some of the people were coming down out of Boar's Head, and if they're leaving their house, it's one thing. And I did have a few people that called that were upset because they couldn't get back to their houses. Uh, although one of them would have been down there at Glade Path, and it must have been the state police were there. Yes. Yeah. They, uh, they were, you know, they said the people were very nice to them. Then there were some other people down on Winnicott Road. They weren't quite so happy. But I, I think that the people should understand that if they're going to be out and the water's like that and the way all those rocks are in the road. Well, the water, when you look at how a storm starts to develop, especially along the seacoast, and a lot of us have been here for a lot of years, and we're used to how that happens, uh, the governor came down Saturday morning. And so we gave him a tour. He came down earlier and uh, took him around to some of the areas that had been adversely affected and advised them that when we were by the uh, town seawall at Bicentennial Park, he said, this area will be underwater within an hour. And most people find that hard to believe that the water splashing within an hour is going to be up over in the oceans right there. And trying to explain that to people so when they leave particular areas like Boar's Head or King's Highway, they've left and now they want to come back and can't get back because the intersections are underwater. Mm -hmm. And some of them do get very upset with the police and, and argumentative, and it's it's just, if I could turn the water off, I would. <laughs> but a, a lot of people don't understand. They think when the high tide comes from the ocean, it's a full hour later when it starts coming in from the marsh, pretty much. It takes a, it, there is a time delay from yeah. the water being pushed into those est those estuary areas, developing to that level, and then it starts coming in from the back. So it was a great photo. I don't know who put it on a, on a Facebook account of somebody got a photo when the weather had cleared of what Hampton Beach looked like uh, as those surges were taking place. And it just looked, 1A looked like a little strip from, from Boar's Head to the bridge. Mm -hmm. uh, it was amazing the amount of water that surrounds that area of land and we drive through and we don't see that. Mm -hmm. But it's there and when those levels rise and your property right there is an example of it. As I was driving by, I had a uh, Homeland Security rep uh, with me all day Friday so they could get first hand view of what happens down here. And I said, we're going to come back here in about 45 minutes 
And see those sandbags there? The water will be up to the sandbags, and his entire driveway will part, be part of Lake Hampton. Mm -hmm. And we came back about 45 minutes later, and exactly the water level was where we thought it was going to be. Uh, it's an amazing thing how quickly the water rises. It goes out fast, too, ordinarily. But the, ordinarily. Wind, the wind sort of changes that. It was interesting, too, to um, see, you know, part of the problem was, like, at certain times, people started driving on the medium there with one tire, and then... I was doing that. Yeah, I, I noticed <laughs> the police were doing it, and I, I think that was a good idea. But then other times, kids in trucks would come by, and they would pass people on the right, and really, that's where the problem is, is that type of behavior from kids. You know, it just it makes everything a lot more miserable. So I think you did a great job. And the interesting thing will be, it will all be different on Wednesday when it's snow. That adds another dimension depending on the snow because it winds up clogging our drains up and causing other issues along with flooding. So we saw that the storm, uh, the last prior storm. Do you think that if there would have been a lot of snow and ice like in the marsh and, uh, you know, everywhere, that when these tides came it would have been a lot worse? Oh, absolutely. The, yeah. the, the prior storm, we saw that on Ashworth Ave. There were mini icebergs yeah. mm -hmm. out in the middle of the roadway that floated up from the back streets, and those caused more work for us. You know, it would be great if the water just came in and receded, but <clears> it weaves <throat> debris that you still can't drive down the road, and those big chunks of ice are, are bad obstacles. You can't move them by hand. You need to have a plow come in or an excavator come in and push those off to the side of the road before we can open the roadway safely. Well, so you did a good job. I was glad I had a good book <laughs> sitting there <laughs> watching it for like 30 hours. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Bean. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chief, uh, you and I go back some 30 years to uh, um, the big green machine and uh, um, I, being older than you, have watched you uh, um, progress in your career and uh, you are the preeminent law enforcement uh, police chief uh, in the state of New Hampshire, in my opinion. You have uh, an unparalleled uh, threat level with Mother Nature, uh, with crowds, uh, and it's not well understood, both in terms of uh, leading your department operationally, um, liaising with the state, and uh, um, confronting threat from Mother Nature. And uh, you're the bull in uh, the uh, leadership uh, as we used to say in the Marine Corps, you're the bull department head, and I know you uh, won't agree with that, uh, but you are the senior uh, department head. Uh, you've progressed through the ranks in New Hampshire, and I'm just so proud of uh, your performance through uh, three decades and more. Uh, you're a Hampton native. Uh, you're in the mercantile uh, business with your family in the hospitality business, and I know you learn things from this storm, uh, and you continue to lead your department and bring others up that will eventually someday replace your billet as you have done uh, with Chief Sullivan. So to your department, to your men, uh, great work. And I know that you've learned things and that you will uh, incorporate those lessons learned uh, in the future events. And thank you. And Mr. Welch, thank you for your great leadership in this as well. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Great thank job. You. Great report. Fred, we'll see Fingers you in the morning. So get ready for the next one. <laughs> Fingers crossed on Wednesday. Thank you. Appointments, Ed Tinker. Chief Assessor, Land Use Change Tax Waiver, Request 230 and 232 Exeter Road, Map 68, Lots 1, Lots 7 1 and 7 2. Thank you. Thank you. Um, property owner did come um, to see the board, and I, I wrote up a, a, a report for you. Um, some of the items included um, were some meetings from September of 16 when the property owner met with the Board of Selectmen. Um, also included is a, a deed where 12 acres of the 13.71 acre parcel was transferred uh, to the town of Hampton uh, back in December 18th of 17. Um, and some other uh, property cards and uh, maps for you to, to review. Um, I did uh, submit two documents that um, require signatures based on your decision tonight. Um, I can answer any questions regarding that um, property as the land use change tax. The value of those two lots that the request is made for is uh, is two buildable lots, 230, 232, as you said, equals about $131,300. So the land use change tax would be 10%, I'm sorry, 313,100. Uh, the 10% penalty would be 31,310, and that's what the property owner is requesting as a waiver to that land use change tax. Okay. 
if you have any questions, I can so answer those. So I remember looking through the minutes. So he donated 12 acres of the land to the town? Yeah, that took place December 18th. It was uh, signed. The and deed now, was signed. Okay. And now he's looking to, for us to just abate the... Uh, the, the land the is changed tax based on those two billable lots that remain on uh, Exeter Road. Okay, great. I have no questions. Thank you. Okay. Rusty, and the size is what? Twelve acres, right? The, the, yes. To the ham, yes, twelve to the, acres. To twelve acres. And one, one additional uh, point of that is that the town already has a, a small parcel on uh, Langdale for access to that lot. Otherwise, it would be just back land. But the one good benefit of it is the town we has, do have access. To has it. access. Yeah. Okay. Thank yeah. you. So, do we need a motion for this? Do you have any questions? No, but I'm willing to make the motion. Okay, went, Phil. Yeah, and, and I would just say this is an incredibly generous office uh, offer uh, and uh, execution by the uh, taxpayers. And uh, Mr. Chinky, you've done a, a very nice job in presenting this, and uh, I'm happy to hear a motion. Did you want to say anything, Fred, on this? Uh, you do need a motion, Mr. Chairman. I'll yeah. make that motion. Do any oh, this is this is a great piece of property for the town. There's no question about that. Uh, hopefully, it'll be kept in its current state for many years to come. I realize that at some point in the future, gosh knows how many years from now, it's going to have to be selectively logged so the trees don't get out of control and, and uh, the rest of the trees in the property are preserved and allowed to grow to their full height and, and, and size. Uh, but we need, to, we need to properly maintain the property once you get into this proposition. Okay. So I'll make that motion. Motion. Second. Second. All in favor? Opposed? Unanimous. Okay, thank you. And, then, thank and again, there should be two documents for you yep. to sign. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Yep. Have a good night. Christy Pulliam, Finance Director, Transfer to Compensated Absence Fund. Good evening. Good evening. I sent a memo out. Sorry you didn't get it till about lunchtime today, but we were all kind of busy with the storm last week. So basically, every year at the end of the fiscal year, if there's any money remaining in the uh, employee separation cost line item or the bank buyback program line item of the budget, the board has authority under um, a Warren article in 2009, Warren article number 30, to transfer that balance to the compensated leave trust fund that's held by the uh, trustees of the trust funds. This year, uh, between those two line items, the net money left was $40,187.84. Um, I broke down there for you. The bank buyback line had $190,000 as a budget and was $204,410 was spent from that line. And the employee separation cost had a budgeted amount of $212,000 and $112,000 and $157,401 was spent. So that nets out to $40,187.84 that is available to be transferred to the Compensated Leave Trust Fund if the board chooses to do so. Um, I also added a paragraph there just explaining what the employee separation cost line item is for and what the bank buyback program is for. Uh, employee separation is just any employees who retire or leave their employment with the town if they're owed any of their sick uh, vacation or leave time it is paid out to them from that line item in the budget and the bank buyback program is available to both uh, union and non-union members and it's either the sick or leave time depending on what category of um, employee you're dealing with and it's different guidelines in both the union contracts and the personnel policy for the non-union members in regards to how much balance the employee has to have before they can sell back. And it can be used to pay for things such as insurance, convert to vacation time, make contributions to their 457, or a cash uh, payout to cover education costs. So that kind of gives you some history there, um, what those line items are for. And also I included uh, at the two that time of the 2016 audit, the Compensated absence long-term liability for the town was one million three hundred fifty-four thousand seven hundred sixty-six dollars. So, try to bury you with facts. So that's what I have. Questions? I have no questions. Thank you, Rusty. No, I just one of the things looking through the town report in part of the um, annual money that we pay out to the employees. Um, that's part of what the the money that some of these people have made. Is the buyout correct? Correct. Okay. 
So it's not that they're making big money. You know, the reason they oh, are making... Oh, absolutely not. No, you're talking about yeah. the town report. Yes. When right. They received um, a lot of them who have been here multiple years and stuff have money that they can sell back. And so that does have to be included with the wages. And we usually gray that out so people will notice it's not all strictly uh, base salary. Okay. Thank it you. is included in there. Thanks for all the facts. Bill. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. So this is the uncompensated fund balance, correct? This is the compensated leave trust fund. It's the official name on the okay. MS9. And uh, on the on the balance sheet, it shows a liability of how much? Uh, 1.3 million. Okay. Almost and, 1.4. And so that is a liability. Yes. And that is an audited liability. Correct. As it stands now that the town owes. And is that funded? Um, four hundred and ninety-two thousand one hundred and thirteen dollars and seventy-nine cents was the balance in the compensated leave trust fund. Okay, and at the end of seventeen, I, I would just say this to the board, and I'm I'm going ashore, as they say, uh, very soon in the next couple of weeks, and I've I've said this publicly before. Uh, I don't like uh, the way that this is recorded uh, in the town. I think that uh, taxpayers and uh, um, citizens. And employees should know that that money is set aside in a fund that is fully funded. We have a pension fund that is underfunded by hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars for state employees. We've had the state walk away for it from their obligations. And I think that the town of Hampton should actually fully fund those obligations. I think it is um, uh, not consistent with GASB requirements and reporting requirements for depreciation that we've instituted. I think it's inconsistent with GASB requirements that we've instituted in this board to fully record the 20 something million dollars we have in unfunded pension obligations. Uh, and the, the public is not warned properly. And I think it benefits the employees. I, I know it benefits the taxpayers that, that that money should be set aside. This is my personal opinion, but I think it's perfectly consistent with best practices in financial management. And I think just simply to have something underfunded by hundreds of thousands of dollars, and then we have to sweep that money. And this is an obligation that the town has to its employees, and it's an important one. And if it's that important and it's that honorable, then I think it should be fully funded and that our financial practices should be executed in a much better fashion with help perhaps from our auditors uh, to guide the board or future board if they choose to do so. But that's my opinion, and I think it's an important uh, change that, uh, and an important delta that we should execute in this town to, to uh, satisfy that obligation. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Director. How much should we transfer <coughs> last year to this? A hundred and seventy one thousand two hundred and forty two dollars and seventy eight cents. And we transferred for that from from these two lines, the balance in those line items last year. Okay. We had a lot of employees uh retire in seventeen, so therefore there's not as much money left on those line items this year. Okay. So do I have a motion to I will move. Second. All in favor? Opposed? Okay. Thank you very much. Thank Anything you. else? That's all I have. All right. Thank you. Thanks. Approval of minutes, February 5th, 2018, non-public session. So moved. Second. Uh, February 12th, 2018, non-public so session. Second. All in favor? Opposed? Town manager's report. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, members of the board, uh, the filing period for property tax abatements passed on March 1st, 2018. Uh, anyone wishing to file will have to wait until 2019 under the statute. So we are closed in that department for this year. The annual town meeting and election will be held on Tuesday, March 13th at the Winnicott High School. Polls are open from 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. For those who cannot attend but wish to and are eligible to vote, will need to submit an application for an absentee ballot. Forms for that application are available on the town website and at the town clerk's office. Please follow the, the instructions carefully. Property owners who are eligible for veterans, elderly, and blind exemptions from property taxes must obtain, complete, and file applications with the town assessor's office not later than April 15, 2018. Likewise, property owners who are eligible for the Hampton Beach Precinct tax exemption must obtain the necessary form from the town assessor's office and file by February, uh, February April 18th, April 15th, excuse me. Um, I did receive a, um, a bulletin from um, the Hampton School District, SA Unity. <clears throat> they are going to hold, uh, in conjunction with the Hampton PTA and the school district, 
a community safety forum on March 8th at the Marston School in the school cafeteria. The forum will begin at 6.30 p.m. Public is invited, obviously. The forum will address the safety measures in place at the schools and provide information on the collaboration with the police department and fire departments. There will be an opportunity for questions and, and <coughs> concerns from families and community members. Joining the Hampton SAU 90 administrators will be members of the Hampton Police Department, including Chief Sawyer, Deputy Chief Hobbs, and School Resource Officer uh, Matthew Robinson. In addition, members of the Hampton Fire Department, Chief Ayotte, and the Emergency Response Team will be present to offer information and answer questions. School security is the number one priority for the Hampton School Board. They have established goals for the schools to ensure there is a high level of safety for students, faculty, and families. Please join us for this forum and bring your questions and concerns. Your input and feedback will help the district strengthen the security plans for the schools. If you have any questions prior to the meeting, please call the SAU office at 926-4560. Thank you. And signed by the superintendent of schools. Um, Mr. Chairman, uh, we have changed <coughs> One of our vendors in the Public Works Department, uh, we have a person that was collecting Freon uh, and battery recycling. We have changed that person uh, at the request of the EPA. Um, we now have a new vendor. There, it, is, it is a dollar more expensive per appliance to do what we're doing. Uh, and uh, we'll be recouping that money as we have in the past. Uh, also, they're going to be paying us something we have not had in the past, and that is they're going to pay the town 34 cents per pound for batteries that are recycled at the center. So that will be a new income stream to the town for revenue purposes. Now, now what kinds of batteries does that include? That's automobile batteries. Okay. We don't, uh, we don't collect the small batteries uh, at this point, but I'd like to because they're obviously a problem. Um, the Neil Underwood Bridge inspections, we have been inspecting the Neil Underwood Bridge and the lines that run underneath the bridge for our sewer. Um, they seem to be completely intact at this point. There's nothing wrong with them, although one is that the main sewer line is, is completely bare. There's no sand covering it at all. It's laying on the harbor bottom, but it is intact. Uh, we also notified um, the water department today that they have two lines running underneath the harbor at that location, and one of those lines <clears throat> appears to have been washed underneath. It's free. It's sort of s suspending itself on top of the harbor floor, and that's we were concerned because that could cause vibrations in the line and perhaps break it down, <coughs> which is not a good thing. But they do have two lines, so there's only one involved. They're going to examine that today after our notice. Uh, Public Works also noticed the, uh, notified the gas company because they also have a line running underneath the uh, the harbor at that location. We. Um, we had a notice from the Municipal Association that um, there's a House bill coming up before House Ways, and it's a House of Ways Means bill <coughs> that was amended by them, uh, HB 1381, which deals with a change in valuation of uh, utility property in the town. Uh, I'm going to notify our representatives and Senator tomorrow that <coughs> our best calculation is the town will have to raise an additional $500,000 to make up for this bill should it pass. Um, that will depend on whether or not it's amended, whether or not it passes, uh, and that sum will, of course, increase because the way the bill is structured, it will decrease the value of their property for tax assessment as time goes along. And that's it, sir. Senator Morrow, or do you mean Senator Ernest? Senator, Senator Ennis, it's not tomorrow. It's tomorrow, tomorrow, okay. Tomorrow. I didn't think I didn't hear Ennis. <laughs> questions? I have no questions. Thank Rusty. you, Mr. Mayor. Well, you, you, you brought up the, the point on batteries and stuff. I had a gentleman the other day call me and he was asking about batteries. What do we do with the smaller batteries? We, there's no collection program for them. That's part of the problem, as I see it. Uh, people put the small batteries into the trash and they go to. Um, the landfill. I'd prefer to see them come out of the trash altogether. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> the problem is getting the special permits in order to handle them. And we'd have to file with the state for special permits and special requirements to do that. So right now the 
recommended ways to throw them in the trash. Well, not my recommended way. That's no, what they're that's doing. But they have to do that's it. That's what they're doing. They can't get rid of them. They they got to do something with them. That's correct. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. And, and I would I would add to that that <clears throat> if you're going to get rid of, uh, usually at the uh, sometime during the year I do mine in September. I replace all the batteries <coughs> and I smoke Smoked. detectors. Yep. Um, I save the slips that they come in and reinsert them in the slips because you don't want to throw those into a trash container and possibly have the neutral and the batteries come together and cause an arc which could cause a fire. So you need to package those and, and seal them up so that they, they don't fall out and don't connect with each other. It's very important to do things like that. Rick, you said nothing? No, thank Bill? you. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Welch. Uh, public Works, uh, Please tell us um, the uh, about the nine million gallons that they processed during the storm and what our normal Only take is. Million. Exactly, and, and what what a tremendous tremendous challenge that was, equal wow. to any operational with personnel. Just happened to have the report with. Uh, and I knew you would. <clears throat> we uh, we started on uh, this is from Thursday uh, three one. Uh, the total amount of uh, waste coming into liquid waste coming into and solid waste coming into the wastewater treatment plant was 2.31 million gallons on that day. Uh, Friday we had the storm and we went from, from 2.31 million gallons to 4.36 million gallons. And on Saturday we went to 5.96 million gallons. And on Sunday we went to 9 million gallons. That's a significant amount of increase, most of it from infiltration. Uh, as you know, the water levels uh, in the marsh were very, very high. In fact, they were over the top of our line coming in from the south end of the beach to the, the treatment, uh, the uh, pumping station on Church Street. Those have not been completely repaired and relined, and there's a couple of covers that have not been replaced yet. It's a, it's a work in progress and has been a work in progress now for several years. Obviously, they were taking water from the marsh. Uh, and there was water also coming into some of the manholes up on the main streets, which were underwater as well. Uh, we're about at our max as far as the amount of water we can take and treat at the treatment plant. One of the bad things about this is it's salt water. Salt water kills the bugs, as we call them, in the plant that, that, that in fact eat the material that's bad for us and shouldn't be discharged into the environment. Uh, they're efforting to see that we have very healthy bugs at the plant at this moment. So, and we have no indication that we're, we're in trouble, but we need to keep a close eye on it. Uh, there's going to have to something be done about sealing those manholes and redoing them and sealing those, sealing the tops of them and so forth. We are working on that very energetically, but there's just so much to do and so little time in which to do it. But we are progressing well. With the funds that we have available. Thank you. And where there were no violations of uh, with any levels of discharge uh, of effluent, is that correct? There were no violations whatsoever. Our staff worked overtime to make sure there were not violations. Correct. And uh, it was widely reported that on the Merrimack, there were uh, myriad uh, municipalities that had raw sewage uh, discharge uh, into the Merrimack River. That was in Boston papers. And uh, despite uh, equal hardships here in Hampton, uh, our great crew under your leadership and uh, Mr. Jacobs and Jennifer Hale and Michael at the station um, and those people, not one discrepancy with the storm. And it's, it's another incredible story uh, of this municipal platform uh, and how it executes in, in the harshness of terrain, population, and uh, we do it alone. We, we do this alone here. We do it with our money and incredi in incredibly, incredibly well. And uh, I would segue into this, this uh, um, recognition of how extraordinary this municipal platform is and how well this town is run uh, to say that Articles 10, 11, and 12 are coming up uh, for labor contracts uh, in this next election, um, this, this next few weeks. And those are for three different bargaining units. And those are the people that made this happen when we all took shelter, when we all hoped that things went well when we all delegated that authority uh, to perform these civic duties in this municipal service platform. And I think there could be no better uh, commendation, no better praise, no better reason than to vote yes on 10, 11, and 12 than to look at uh, how all of these units and all those that aren't up 
um, but to, to support those and to vote yes. And uh, if you could pass that on, Mr. Welch, to your department heads, I know the, the chairman and the rest of the board feels the exact same way. I certainly will. Thank you. And then I would like to just talk <coughs> briefly, if I may. Um, Mr. Welch, I, I know there was a storm. I do not discount those that spoke on article number nine this evening, Mr. Chairman. We did ask to have it on. I know there was a storm. That's probably the reason it's not on. It, it makes me uncomfortable that, that um, they have legitimate questions as citizens, and perhaps we can get it on next week, or there's an information package that uh, we can put out to clarify some of the questions uh, because uh, they didn't get answered, and I know it's because of the storm, and if we could uh, we, we could get that information out to some of these people that have requested it, and certainly I would be interested in a, a synopsis of that. And thank certainly you, Mr. Will. Welch. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have a question on infiltration. Infiltration. Yeah. And we have a plan in effect <coughs> to be dealing with them, to, to be repairing infiltration, to decrease infiltration. That's correct. It's It's... We have a, a very obsolete sewer system as far as the collection system is concerned. We have a lot of streets in town that have old clay pipes. <clears throat> they are dry joints, that is to say they're not solid like they are with lock joints, which we would have in, in uh, or welded joints, which we'd have in, in plastic pipe that we're now putting in. Um, we're going to have infiltration, and I know the state allows a, a percentage of infiltration, two to three, up to 5% is normal. Uh, but we, we have a lot more than 5%. I mean, this time of the year, we are normally running somewhere about two to two and, two and a half million gallons a day. Nine million gallons is not normal. It's all infiltration. Uh, we need to replace a significant portion of our piping system in order to stop that problem. And of course, I look at this from a different standpoint than I think the layperson does, in that <clears throat> every year, I have to meet with a wastewater treatment plant, and we have to talk about what we're going to put in the budget in order to run the plant from a chemical standpoint. We're treating water that doesn't need to be treated, and in doing that, we're spending a sub substantial amount of extra money for nothing, basically. Uh, that water shouldn't be there, but it's going to take a number of years, in fact, probably a couple of decades provided we spend an awful lot of money to get that stop. And another question, is there any evidence that it's people pumping <clears throat> sump pumps into the sewer system? We have a number of areas in town where in fact that is the case. Uh, simply because we know they're pumping because of where they are, we know what the water levels are in those areas, uh, and we know if they were pumping out of the street we'd see it. They're not. And that's illegal, isn't it? It is illegal under state and federal law. Okay. Thank you. Anything else for the town manager? No. Old business. Virginia? Um, or anybody. Yeah, I mean, I was going to bring up the, uh, the article number nine. I would like to... Uh, have those questions answered for the people that were in here tonight to talk about it. So, okay, but I guess that's already been. Well, since, since we're doing that, I would just like to, uh, since there was implications made, that I was the only selectman that voted against not recommending that, or that not Article Nine, the one last year, the Experience Hampton, Article Forty or Forty Four, whatever it was. Mr. Chairman, if I may, I may say that I, I disagree with the uh, uh, people that. Um, uh, impugn others' integrity here in, 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 this, uh, um, in this forum, and there's been far too much of it. I'll speak a little bit later about Mr. Rice, but uh, um, there, there are disagreements naturally in the discourse of uh, uh, public service, but to impugn um, your wife or you publicly uh, is beyond the pale. I don't support it. I don't buy it. And there were comments last week about, I believe, Mr. Bridal's spouse. Um, about uh, some chamber or every, uh, you can't keep these organiz these wonderful charitable organizations straight but to uh, engage in, in public service uh, does not mean that you are subject to uh, uh, people impugning your integrity so I, I support um, uh, what you're suggesting that uh, um, you voted against that you don't have to explain yourself and uh, I want to thank you for your service um, on the board and uh, again, reject any assertion that uh, you influenced uh, anybody on this board on any vote 
to include number nine. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Anything else under old business? Yes. Yeah. What is this on the planning board uh, under other business? There's a process to purchase leasing or purchase or leasing of town owned land. Why is that at the planning board? That's probably a 4114A proposal by someone, mm -hmm. and, and that has to, by law, go to the planning board for a recommendation for or against <coughs> the proposal. And the same with the Conservation Commission. Before it can come to the Board of Selectmen, who are the only ones who can officially endorse a RSA 4114A process, you had one on the agenda for this evening, mm -hmm. and, and I believe that's, that, that's the type of process we're looking at that is required by statute. So is the plan, uh, the Conservation Commission involved there too? They have to also approve or deny the request. And bef if they do not approve, uh, they don't take action. It can't come before the selectmen for action. Oh, okay. It's the way the statute is set up. Thank you. Okay. I've, uh, got, I've got one item okay, under old go. business, Mr. Chairman, if you may. And, and again, I, I brought up um, that I wanted to respond to uh, Mr. Rice's article uh, in the paper on Friday, and uh, I, I have I have here, and it's highlighted in red, is um, the actual summons in a civil action. And uh, this board has this board has voted four to one after six years, and and since 1933 to have a discussion um, uh, with the state with in the court system. One of the three legs of government is the ju judicial. There's the legislative, and there's the executive. And uh, that's what this board has voted on. And again, public service um, is uh, sometimes difficult, and uh, it's always difficult, especially in this day and age. And uh, I've served six years. I've done this um, um, in another town for three years. I've been chairman in two different towns. Uh, I started my public service and sworn service uh, as a 19-year-old. It's remained continuous and con continuous and concurrent um, through every decade of my life. Uh, it's been sworn service, which is different than a service where you might just want to leave. Um, I have served in this town now for six years, and I'm wrapping up, and it's been a privilege to serve. Uh, and I was surprised by um, the article, um, Inside Politics by uh, Citizen Rice in this town on Friday. Um, I have served as chair, and I was relieved as chair. Um, by uh, selectmen uh, on this board. Uh, sat right where you sat, Mr. Chairman, and uh, um, took my medicine and continued to serve. They're one of the finest uh, servants this town has ever had, both at the state and uh, that sat right here, resigned that very night and brought his signature uh, resignation in the next. And uh, rightfully so, he called, um, he called things a circus, and I thought that that was... Uh, um, gratuitous. I thought it was worse than that. But I uh, continued to serve. I was uh, reassigned or reelected as chairman, served. You folks came aboard. Um, and uh, we've, we've moved the chains. We've done a good job, um, a real good job collectively. Uh, this, this tort issue, for some reason, um, people don't respect uh, the four to one decision of the board. For some reason, they continue to fight it. Uh, the governor has called me a Pauline. I've been called a fool here at this board. Um, and these things happen. Um, we're only human. Um, but uh, as, as we move on and we open this, this editorial um, from March 2nd, um, I, ca I can take my lumps. Um, as I said, I've served with uh, Richie Sawyer uh, 30 years ago. And, um, but this, this, uh, this inside politics from, from uh, Rice, needs to be dressed and uh, it, it really is below the pale and uh, I, I just can't distance myself enough from it and if you bring up uh, Webster's dictionary and you look at fascism uh, it's the forcible suppression of opposition um, his his uh, manifesto his Stalin-esque manifesto that um, it really is a manifesto it's half the paper um, and it's, it's hard to have the energy to complete the whole thing. Uh, he's a master of the universe. Um, and forget what he says about me. I'm, I'm privileged uh, to be criticized by a man of this caliber. And if Mr. Rice were to uh, support me, uh, I would uh, disavow his support. And I would, uh, I would turn away from it. And 
I, I can do that on my own. Um, but he gets into um, Mindy Mesmer regarding Coakley. We have paid $15,000 for Dr. Ballestero to support our efforts here. We have a 66 million gallon well that is shut down. And uh, Mr. Rice, who is the master of the universe on everything, um, asserts, um, because I guess he is uh, a scientist from UNH that uh, we paid $15,000 for that actually taught the EPA head administrator in Boston. But he says, it has no effect on Hampton or its water supply. I guess we just shut down 66 million gallon wells for nothing. And going on, he, he, um, he has plenty to say about me, um, but his misogyny, in, in addition to this, this borderline fascism that he executes, and that's right out of Webster's, is uh, falling right in line with Bean's fabrications and fantasies. Selectman Regina Barnes has made an unbelievable claim. And so he's misogynist in, in that respect, which is the attacking of women particularly. And here it is right in the paper, um, falling right in line. He's attacking um, Selectman Barnes, uh, who very well will probably, in accordance with custom, be the next chair of this body um, because she's not up for re-election and she's in, she's in the pipeline for that. So I, I, I turn away from that and again um, uh, condemn that in the a, in a most possible uh, vigorous way. And then there were people in here this evening, uh, some of whom I have served with before, two of them that voted to remove me as chair that I have served with. I have never called them a fool in public. I have never called them appalling in public. I served with them. We voted on uh, different issues and that's what I signed up for but I have never uh, stooped to that level publicly um, as others have towards uh, uh, other board members or representatives in this state. And he goes on to say in this, again, attacking a woman um, in a misogynist fashion, Ms. Woolsey and Jones. Candidates Woolsey and Jones both favor the lawsuit, perhaps because it will give them numerous opportunities to climb on their soapbox and blame the state for everything that they fail to do. And again, uh, I go to the definition of fascism out of Webster's and it's the forcible suppression of opposition. And I would say to those that are, that are running for selectmen, including you, Mr. Chairman, that have, have sought to run again, and everybody that's on this board, not to succumb to the bullying of Rice, not succumb to the personal attacks, and not to take that low road and to support the democratic process and to disavow those tactics and, and speak up when they happen. And it's very difficult for people um, to run for public office uh, in, the, in the easiest sense of the word, just to put their name on a ballot and devote the time. And then when you have um, this insanity that Rice has put out, this misogynist, fascist insanity, attacking women and attacking public services, calling fantasies, bomb throwers. Um, that is not what Hampton's about. I don't know where he went to college. I know where I went to college. It's the University of New Hampshire. And uh, I never learned that in school. I didn't learn that at Winnicott. I didn't learn that at uh, uh, Hampton Junior High. I didn't learn it, learn it in Mendham Junior High School in New Jersey. I didn't learn it in Hingham Public Schools, one through eight where Dick Nichols went. I didn't learn it in 31 years in the Coast Guard and the Marine Corps. I didn't learn it as a chairman of the board in Milton, New Hampshire. I certainly didn't learn it on this board, and you haven't heard it here from me. And so I wanted to share that, and I would say to people not to be intimidated, um, those that are running, and, and uh, succumb to this rant uh, from Rice that was uh, recently executed. And uh, I, w I will leave it at that. And uh, I don't want to be around Mr. Rice. I don't want to hear what he has to say. I don't want to breathe the same air. I don't want to be in the same room with him. And he does not represent Hampton. Uh, and I cannot be more emphatic about that. And I'm not calling him a fool. And I'm not calling him appalling. I have referenced a Webster's dictionary term that describes fascism, that describes his behavior. And misogyny is, if you look it up, uh, an attacking of women and a devaluing of them, and he's attacking two women uh, in the paper this weekend. I am uh, the father of two daughters. 
I am the father of four granddaughters, and uh, I don't particularly like it when uh, old men attack women, especially publicly. It uh, diminishes their, their, uh, their ability to lead effectively, and uh, it's a black mark on uh, Hampton uh, that he has offered, and then to say that he is a former this and a former that and a former this and the master of the universe. And uh, I'll conclude my remarks on that, and thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And I would wish all those that, that are running for selectmen, including you, Mr. Chairman, uh, the best of luck in the election. Thank you. Um, I would like to say something on that note, because I actually was informed of that editorial, and I went on and I looked at it myself, and I must have been so upset by the time I got to that part of the article, I didn't even read my, whole, my own name in the article, because I was upset of how Selectman Bean's efforts were being portrayed in that editorial. I don't really care what Fred Rice has to think about the lawsuit. I don't really care what precinct commissioners have to say about it. I don't really care about what the state has to say about it. All I know is Selectman Beans has worked on it for six years, and I came in here, and I immediately started looking at the same thing that I'm sure he had already studied, and I immediately saw it right away. Money's flying out of here year after year, and we get, what, 1.5, 1.6 million back, everything put together? Not right. Not doesn't make sense. And I don't want to be in a room with Fred Rice. I don't want to be in a room with anyone that tries to demean some, an elected official who's actually doing their job for their hometown. And um, yeah, what you said about degrading women, I mean, personally, myself, I don't really care what he has to say about me. But uh, I think that's awful. And I think people need to remember that the key word is former. And I would uh, add one more thing, Mr. Um, Chairman, on March 2nd, 2018, at 1429.57, I received an email from uh, one of Hampton's uh, finest citizens, and finest among the finest citizens in this country. And it was from, uh, it is from a uh, uh, former head of a VSO, and for many people that uh, don't serve in the military, and there's a lot of them that don't, uh, it's a veteran service organization, and it's in this town. And he's a family man, and he is a cultural icon. He is a father, a grandfather. Uh, he is a, a warrior. He is a U.S. Marine. And Fred Rice called him up last month. And uh, this, this person uh, his, he says, Phil, just wanted, to you know, wanted you to know that I am disgusted with Fred. He called me a month ago looking for any info I might have on you. And I won't, I won't say about what else is in this email, but when you talk about the suppression of opposing opinion, and you read that article, and then you combine it with somebody making phone calls, making phone calls to heads of public service organizations and veterans organizations uh, in this town to find dirt on them. Uh, again, I don't want to be in the same room as, room as Fred Rice. I never want to speak to Fred Rice. Uh, I don't want to be around his uh, snooping J. Edgar Hoover ways. I don't want to be around anybody that's looking for dirt on anybody. And again, I've, uh, I've taken some uh, hits here because that's what you do when you serve. And I stood here and uh, I served and I showed up for every single meeting uh, after I was relieved. But again, um, this, this uh, was from one of the leading citizens in New Hampshire, uh, in New Hampshire and in this town. And, so, and he concludes, if there's anything you need to do, do not hesitate to ask. And that that is what uh, Mr. Rice is all about. He's a misogynist in his, in his uh, writings. Uh, he's a fascist in his writings. And he's trying to oppress candidacies. And he's calling up people, uh, as they would do in the Kremlin, as Mr. Putin might, and uh, asking if there's any dirt on Selectman Representative Bean former Lieutenant Colonel Bean, former bosun's mate, third class Bean, a business owner in town. Uh, and that, my friends, is something that is a black mark uh, on his name, and it's a black mark uh, when he represents himself as an ambassador and a former public servant in Hampton. Thank you again, Mr. Chairman. New business. Um, I'm oh. not, I haven't talked. Yeah, well, just <coughs> to point out, Fred did graduate from West Point for anyone that thinks he didn't go to college or whatever, um, which for whatever that means. Um, 
And I went to the library to read it too because I heard people talking about the uh, editorial or whatever. Um, <clears throat> so I made a point right before this meeting to go and, and read it. Um, and I just want to say that um, I think that, you know, it's been discussed here. I, for one, who have voted to go along with the lawsuit, I'm hoping that it will end up in med med mediation. Um, I think it's the way to go. Um, I do, and I've talked to people today when I went to the gym, people were asking about it. Um, you know, I feel that after having been here for 14 years, the state doesn't come, and they've never really come and met and talked to the Board of Selectmen. That's why I think that this, uh, and I, I tell everyone that when I see it referred to here from Mark Gerald, it's referred to as a complaint more than a lawsuit. Um, and I do think the ultimate goal, as far as I'm concerned, is to have some type of mediation. Um, and uh, so I think already the state has been doing little things uh, that they weren't even doing before, like uh, plowing the uh, North Beach seawall, which it's amazing. Uh, Every time I leave my house, I look to see how many people are walking on it when there were times when it was completely clear, when there was snow in the street and that. It's amazing how many people use it. It's one of the most popular places to walk <coughs> in Hampton. But for the last, uh, they did it a couple of times maybe last year, and maybe a time, one time the year before. But they seem to be doing it every month now, or I mean every snowstorm now. And I think that's good. So I think they're, they are trying. I see them trying a little harder. Uh, so maybe when we get to a point where there is some mediation, they'll be willing to come and talk here to this board. That's what has not happened. It's not happened for the last 14 years. I don't think we've had any, um, uh, any other way to go but to do this. And I'm hoping that they will come and talk. I saw that the governor was down there um, at the statue yesterday or the day before, um, and it's nice, but uh, we've had other governors that have come here and uh, he could talk off the cuff even uh, and give us some respect here, but he doesn't. And um, I think that that's where we need to go here. I've spent uh, 10 years at the Hampton Beach Area Commission. I don't see anything happening there uh, as far as uh, uh, bringing the town together with the state, even though it's been talked about it, there's been discussion about the sidewalks that's been fought over and over and over again, where there were many people that didn't want to go along with it, and eventually uh, we made some agreements, but that was probably, I don't know, four years ago, nothing's happened, there's no nothing to talk about, the sidewalks look worse now than ever. Uh, uh, the way it's gone at the Hampton Beach Area Commission, I, as a member, I just, it's hard for me to believe what's gone on there. Um, I'm all for better things to happen, so I, I can't go against what's been decided, but I see things taken out that are important, and um, I think that there needs to be some type of conversation. There is absolutely zip amount of conversation with the state, and that's why this uh, situation has go, had to go to this point. And um, as far as I'm concerned, it is a complaint, and I'm looking forward to mitigation. Thank you. Mediation, I mean to say, not mitigation. New business. Hampton Service label pins. Mr. Chairman, on a number of occasions over the last few years, the, the board has asked <coughs> if we could find some really nice pins to give to our employees who have large areas of multiple service to the town. Um, about two weeks ago, I think I handed pins out to all of you. We, we, we do have a, a town pin. Uh, we have a few of them. Uh, I did find an agency after sporadic search over the last few years uh, that in fact make pins of that nature. And uh, what I'd like to do is I'd like to get a cost those pins they're they're very nice pins they're they're metal they're well well uh, well engraved uh, and present they're actually custom lapel pins 
uh, and present that cost and, and, uh, and uh, type of pin to the board for your examination to see whether or not you think we should in fact order those for long-term service employees, particularly at retirement. Okay. Questions? No. Good idea. Anybody? I think it's a great idea. I know a person retired about 13 years ago that got a plastic pin. Yeah. So. Well, that's what I was going to say, that if we did that, <laughs> would, we, would we get them for those that have retired prior we and that we know we of and try and get something to if them? If the board so directs, we certainly will do that. So right. No question about it. I mean, I, I, I mean, with the cost, right? Yes. Yeah. Let's take a look I at it. I think that they, uh, I would rather see them cost more. Yep. Myself. Are these if you're going to hand out a pin, make it a decent pin. The average cost of these is advertised as two dollars a piece. Oh, jeez. Yeah, <coughs> to me, which is bother. fairly inexpensive compared to yeah. a lot of the others that we've looked at. Uh, I, I think it's it's something the board has asked about on numerous occasions. Um, I think we just need to try to find out what's out there, get a cost for you to prepare them, and the quantities that we would need. Uh, and then come back to the board and present it to you for your approval. So moved. Second. Second. Super. Uh, closing comments. I'd like to make a motion that we go into non-public in accordance with RSA 91-8 colon 3, Roman numeral 2, A, C, and E. Second. Roll, uh, roll call. Required. Aye. Okay. Thank you, Channel 22. Thank you, Max.